Hello, Sid Roth, your investigative reporter here with Isaiah Reed. Isaiah, according to my notes, a newspaper said you were the most vicious pimp in Hawaii. That's true. How, you don't look that way now. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> yeah, for sure. I want to take you back. You were raised with a, uh, a godly mother. Yes, sir. And, uh, but you, you kind of liked um, using violence, even as a, as a youngster, and fighting and gangs. Well, it was contrary to, to the lifestyle that I was brought up into, and really it was a challenge to me to make a decision. I was kind of in a, a, a fork of a road in my life. Uh, we didn't practice, we practiced nonviolence in our home. My father preached it, my mother preached it. How many generations of uh, ministers were in your family? Five. I come from five generations of preachers. And uh, it was prophesied when my mother was 17 years old that um, I would minister the gospel. Of course, nobody asked me it was that was going to be my choice. But growing up in that environment, kind of being indoctrinated mm -hmm. into that kind of a Christian lifestyle. I even went to Catholic school and attended a Baptist church. So my the community that I was aware of, not only in my family, but the community that I was aware of as a child concerning my boundaries was all in a religious format. I didn't know any other uh, environment or lifestyle or culture at that particular time. But the long and the short of it is my sister was being bullied at a school and I uh, asked the bully to leave her alone and he, be he wanted to beat me up so I ran. You know, I ran for my life and he began to chase me because I was fearful I never had been in a physical altercation. Right. And I was about maybe 12 or so and, um, and you know how young people are, if they see you run you're going to get beat up, everybody want to watch, so a crowd kind of was running after him and instigating and, and so on and so forth. Anyway, um, I made it home, but I had a cousin there that says, no, you know, we don't run from nobody. You need to, you know, stand up, be a man, that kind of thing, you know, that macho thing. And I was very afraid, very afraid. And um, so I, st I was more afraid of my older cousin than, than of the young, the bully that was chasing me. So I kind of stood my ground and, and I just lunged at him, really, and closed my eyes and I guess out of the fear and out of the terror, I just grabbed a hold of him tight as I could, and I was strangling him. And we ended up on the ground, but I was just holding on, basically so he couldn't get up and hurt me. Mm -hmm. But I had overpowered him and strangled him, and he, he was, you know, crying out, Uncle, let me go, you know, it's right. en enough, it's enough already. And they pulled me off of it, but what took place, it changed me inside, was the accolades. Everybody was happy, everybody was, proud of me and I had never experienced that before where all the attention and all the praise came upon me for something that I had done and that was the pride of life and and so when the pride of life came on me I had an appetite for it and I'm not saying that my parents never praised me or never never no, encouraged no, I understand. me. But let me ask you Isaiah then you went in the military did you get straightened out? Well, the military came from being involved in crime. I was doing drive-by shootings because, like I said, I had an appetite for it, so I got involved in gangs. And during that time, during the Vietnam era, they was taking, you know, incorrigibles, gang members, that sort, and giving us a choice, either go to prison or go to oh, war. Oh, I see. You, didn't go in the, you went in reluctantly. <laughs> yeah. And since I was underage, my father said, send them somewhere as long as you don't come back home because I had just became... Uh, just too unbearable for my family. I mean, uh, by that time, I had two young ladies, and I'm living with my parents, pregnant, you know, out of wedlock, that mm. kind of thing. Drive-by shootings, already dabbling in narcotics, selling drugs. Your parents must have gone through a lot of grief with you. Oh, yeah, a lot of grief. But one thing my parents did do, they stood on the promises of God. You if know, I, I talked to your mother. Did mm. she really get in your face and mm. say, my son is not a pimp, he's a preacher. Oh yeah, not often and much, much as she could. <laughs> and I really thank, her for, thank God for that tenacity and that tenaciousness. And I think every parent, every 
uh, whatever your family situation, whether you're a parent, whether you're a spouse, or whether you're a sibling, if you're the only one that has a promise or has something strong inside of you, a strong faith that you can stand on, on the, the confidence that's in, found in the Word of God, then you need to stand because what it looked like is not what it is. And I, I believe that's what my mother, and, and the more she stood and the more she believed, the worse I got. It seemed like mm -hmm. the situation wouldn't change, but it, it would grow. I mean, the military, you know, I could put on a uniform, I could be a chameleon, so to speak. I could do the military thing. Of course, violence during that time was what they were promoting to defend this nation, but I like the violence on a, a more personal level as far as promoting my own um, being more intimidating, you know, learning mm -hmm. how to shoot, learning how to operate in, in weapons, learning hand-to-hand -hand combat. So that actually enhanced your enhanced. desire. Uh, well, at the top of your career mm -hmm. as a pimp, mm -hmm. how much money were you making? Uh, I think if I was to just average it out, $27 million. Easy. What does someone do with twenty-seven million dollars? Well, it's, it's it's maintenance in that kind of lifestyle. You're if talking you're, about a year. Yeah, if you have a high. <laughs> did, you, <laughs> did you hear that? Twenty-seven million dollars a year. I mean, it would take a, a genius to figure out, I think, how to spend it. But uh, give me a try. I'll, I'll I'll be able to do it. I say. We'll, we'll, we'll be right back after this word. <laughs> Hello YouTube, Mishpocha. Mishpocha is a Hebrew word, it means family. This is Sid Roth. Welcome to my world where it's naturally supernatural. If you've been blessed by this show, please subscribe, then click the bell so you won't miss a single episode of It's Supernatural. We now return to It's Supernatural. Hello, Sid Roth, your investigative reporter here with Isaiah Reed. He was known as the most vicious pimp in Hawaii. Isaiah, you were doing a drug deal that went bad with some Colombians. Mm -hmm. Tell me about that. Um, I was living in Tokyo, Japan, just to kind of give you a little background, and a friend of mine was taking care of the uh, drug operation out of Denver, Colorado and uh, he wanted to retire. He felt as though, because we had made so much money a year, he felt as though we had, was, you know, very fortunate. We got all this money. We really didn't have any diseases because I was also a drug user and mm. sleeping with the prostitutes that I, I sold flesh, but also indulged in the flesh that I sold. So he felt as though that we had got away so long, you know, no really, no incarceration, been arrested, but never convicted of everything. And he thought it would have been a wise choice if we quit. I didn't know no other lifestyle to live. I was living out of Japan and also operating out of Amsterdam where prostitution and drugs is legal. I said, you know, we have finally got our foundation. We don't need to quit. We have places where the authorities really can't do anything to us. We're untouchable at this point. But he was very adamant about it. He had picked up a, a Bible and, and he, didn't want, he mm. didn't want his mother to die with him still living this lifestyle because right. she was uh, getting up in years. Anyway, the long and the short of it is, I flew to Denver, first class, to to convince him to stay in the lifestyle. So I bought a first class ticket to run into a bullet, and uh, and he did, he once again he had the word and he was he was going on. I said, "You've been talking to my mother. <laughs> said, stay away from that woman. You know she's she's you know she's contagious." And he says, "No, no, this has just been, you know, it was and it was just a Gideon Bible out of the mm -hmm. hotel." And uh, I didn't want to hear. I was just so adamant about living my lifestyle. So I said, well, I'll go do the drug deal since I'm here. And we had done the drug deal with these uh, Colombian associates of mine for many years. So it was nothing to be unusual. You know, I was on my guard. I mm -hmm. had my, my sh guns with me, you know, the usual right. kind of a, a setting. Anyway, at the conclusion of the deal, um, we get in the back seat of the car. To get them to take me to the airport so I can go back to Tokyo. And as we're driving along, one of the one of my friends took out a 38 automatic, put it through the base of my head, and shot me. The bullet went, you know, into my brain through my ear canal, and I still have the bullet in my brain today. Disintegrated my jawbone, cracked my skull, and then he shot me again. Went through my nose, through the roof of my mouth, down my throat, and landed in the top vertebrae of my spine. And then they began to stab me and stab me and stab me. And they stabbed me 16 times. And after I was murdered, after I was dead, they hid my body 
in an alley and I stayed there a little over two and a half hours where I died and how I got found a car ran over me and that's how they discovered that. So, so it's you're shot twice, mm -hmm. you're stabbed, mm -hmm. you're bleeding to death, and now a car runs over you for good measure. <laughs> Someone really wants to see you dead. <laughs> okay. Well, it, 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 it was just interesting when I had already bled to death. I mean, I was already dead, but when you die, you don't go to sleep. The real you is on the inside. This is just an earth suit that you can survive in this atmosphere. Um, you know, you can destroy the earth suit, but you can't destroy your essence, the soul. Bullets can't kill it. Um, knives, drugs, disease cannot touch who you are on so, the inside. So, Isaiah, here's the question yeah. I have. They take you to the hospital, mm -hmm. or they take you to the morgue. Where'd they take you? Well, they took me to, see, when the paramedics came, they, they, they call back and they say dead on arrival or, you know, he's dead. I say. And then they bring you back where the, uh, I guess, the chief of surgeon on staff, whoever signs the death certificate, has to look at it. And, and, and certify that it is a death. All right, listen, Man. let's go to Isaiah's mother. The doctor says, we have your son here in the autopsy room. He was pronounced dead on arrival here at Denver General Hospital. And he began to describe uh, some of the things that he was seeing inside of Isaiah's. He was attempting to do the autopsy, and he said, he had bled to death due to gun wounds, and uh, he had been stabbed. And uh, he began to talk, and I says, uh, well, uh, uh, I need to make contact with him. I need to make contact with him. At that time, I didn't know they was monitoring me where I could be here over the hospital. So I asked him if he would put the phone to Isaiah's ear. Oh, okay. So now she knows what's going on, what the deal is. Isaiah, question. Would you be in this chair today alive mm -hmm. if it wasn't for what your mother did? No. All right. Definitely let's, not. let's hear her prayer right now. Let's go back to that telephone call. Lord, you promised. You promised me that my son would be saved. You promised that I would see him saved. I cannot accept this phone call that he's dead. That is not my son. Because my son is saved and full of the Holy Ghost. Lord, you promised me a prophet and not a pimp. And I begin to call life, 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 life back into that body. And I understand that as I begin to call life back into the to his body, he began to breathe again. Now, Isaiah, after your mother prayed, mm -hmm. you came to life. Yes. And, I mean, she, they literally put it so you could hear your, your spirit man, Over your dead body could mm -hmm. hear. You came to life. Mm -hmm. And is it true that you had the nerve to compliment the doctor? that you came back to life. Did you do that? Yes, well, I didn't, you know, I didn't want to be saved. And so when my mother started telling me about the power of God and the, how the Holy Spirit raised me from the dead and how she prayed and interceded and stood in the gap for me, I had heard that, you know, all my young life. And here she go again, badgering me and Bible beating me again. So I didn't want to hear it. So I was looking for man's opinion and man's authority. So I asked the doctor and the doctor basically said, we didn't have anything to do with it. And, 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 you All right, know. Now, if he didn't have anything to do yeah. with it and you were dead, you had to come to the conclusion that your mother prayed and God performed a miracle. Well, so did you immediately turn to Jesus? Oh, no. Uh -uh. No? No, because that, that wasn't a good enough explanation for me. I couldn't. In order for me to turn to Jesus, I had to admit that my, my life was a lie and Jesus is the truth. And it's hard for any individual to admit that they are in error in any way because of our pride and our arrogance. You know, Frank Sinatra, I did it my way kind of attitude. And so I'd rather be dogmatic with going the wrong way than humble myself and submit to the truth. And, but thank God my mother was even more dogmatic to the truth. She was tenacious. Yes, I'll on. tell you, everyone needs a mother like Isaiah had. So he finds himself at a Christmas party. It was a long Christmas party. And this was, what, about three years three later? Years later. Uh, and, and something highly 
unusual occurs. Don't go away. We'll be right back. We now return to It's Supernatural. Hello, Sid Roth, your investigative reporter here with Isaiah Reed. And Isaiah, um, what's going on in your life? Uh, it, how long did it take them to just fix your face with all those stab wounds and bullet wounds? Well, my total recovery took about two years of uh, therapy. The first, uh, the plastic surgery, then because of the gunshot was so close, this was powder burn and my eyes was full of... Uh, you know, the gunpowder to soften mm -hmm. from the explosion. And so I had a lot of trauma in my eye and then my hearing and, and you know, my spine and, and just the whole thing. But my mother said, when well, my God heals, he made whole. And if I can just take a moment uh, for any parent, any uh, family member, once again, you must be tenacious about your home and your family and hold on to a promise that is found in the, in the Holy Scripture. And you have to receive it. You have to go further than your belief, but actually receive that it is done. Receive that you have a promise. And I feel as though right now, not only in America, but across this land and across the world, that if families come together and begin to intercede for, for their family, we have a revival that would join in a revival of nations, of cities, and of communities. So never stop praying and never stop seeking the truth that is found in, in the Word. And I just feel like the Holy Spirit is touching someone right now that has a son or a daughter I was in drugs or even murdered or have some kind of crippling disease. Believe me, prayer works. Isaiah, three years, we fast forward three years, you're at a long three-day Christmas party, mm -hmm. and all of a sudden, one of your prostitutes, this is Christmas party, by mm -hmm. the way, with his, his uh, prostitutes, mm -hmm. one of the prostitutes is having a problem. What happened? One of the prostitutes was tired of the lifestyle, and so she wanted basically to commit suicide. Now, here we are using drugs, smoking crack, heroin, the syringes, you know, the, the, the full-blown atmosphere of our sin. And all of a sudden, she's tired. She's finished. And the only way that she can see to end this madness is to end her life. And so she wants to jump off the balcony. I didn't care. Basically, I wanted to continue. She was just interrupting the party. Me, the party. And I had already stuck a syringe in my throat to shoot the heroin in my system. And Paul, the other drug dealer that was there, said, you know what, you need to deal with this situation because if she jump off the balcony, naturally the police going to come and we're all going to go to jail, so to speak. So I offered Lisa money. She didn't want the money. She said, money doesn't answer everything and you don't love me and I'm tired of being a piece of meat. And she slapped the money out of my hand. That was a clue because normally no <laughs> prostitutes would slap money out of your hand. So I asked Sheila, the other prostitute that was there, to take Lisa in the bathroom to kind of maybe two two women could talk or whatever. Sheila didn't want to have nothing to do with her. So then I said, what I'll do, maybe it's, she wants some more drugs. So I gave her a whole thing of crack cocaine just for herself. She can indulge it and you know do whatever she wanted with it. She slapped the drugs out of my hands. So by this time, rage came on me and I wanted to just knock her unconscious. And as I drew back to punch her in her face, and I drew back my fist and I was getting ready to punch her, all of a sudden out of my, out of me, the crook, the, the pimp, the drug addict came, let me pray for you. And Paul says, pray? Who are you gonna pray to? He said, it must be the drugs. Give me some of what you're using because I want some drugs that make you pray. And so anyway, um, Lisa calmed down. Hmm. And of course, I didn't know anything supernatural at that particular time. I mean, time. that is the last thing you should have been doing. At all. I mean, it's so- oh, it's, it's crazy. Of, yeah, it's, it's out of the- But you're crazy anyway. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so, when I said prayer, the Holy Spirit intervened. And, and I didn't know, touched the heart of Lisa, submerged her in his presence, and she was at, at peace. So I went back, it didn't, it didn't even touch me, didn't even move me. I went back to what I was doing. And so Paul thought that maybe she was running a scam. He says, you know what, you know, really make sure she's okay. I said, look at her, she looks like a little angel or something. He says, no, I says, okay, the word prayer work, let's pray. He says, no, no, I don't want to pray. I said, well, who dope is it? I said, if we don't pray, you don't get no more drugs. They said, okay, let us pray. It's amazing. <laughs> You're in control. <laughs> yeah. It's amazing. People will rally around marijuana and cocaine, but they won't rally around Jesus. So anyway, they submitted to that. And so I hadn't prayed since I was a, a young person, a teenager. And I was asking, you know, one of the prostitutes and the other dope dealer, I said, throw in some suggestions. What should I do? And so Paul says, why don't you close your eyes? 
I said, close my eyes. I'm not going to close my eyes. Last time I closed my eyes, I got shot in the head twice. <laughs> the Bible says, watch and pray. <laughs> you know, I'm in a room full of drug addicts. So anyway, I said, I do remember one thing. We used to hold hands. And so I said, let us hold hands with Paul. He was kind of resistant. He said, hold hand. You don't got queer on me too? I said, if you don't hold my hand, you don't get no more drugs. So he said, okay. So okay. we held hands. So anyway, I, you know, I don't have no religious format. I just talk like a pimp, like a drug dealer. So I just began to kick it with kick it with the man upstairs. I said, check this out, homeboy. You know, Lisa's down here. She's tripping. You know, I don't know what her, her deal is, but, you know, I'm asking you. It's, you know, Jingle Bells time, <laughs> you know, Christmas, that kind of thing. Why don't you give her a chill pill so she can chill? And um, signing off, you know, you the man, talk to you later kind of thing. Really nice, really, you know, I mean, it, it had no substance to it as far as I knew. But the Lord answered me back. He, he spoke said, to you? He said, Isaiah. And I thought somebody was playing a trick on me. So I looked, but I could hear him resonating in my heart, Isaiah. And not only just my name, but challenging me, posing a question. If I had an opportunity to change my life, would I take it? Would I stop being a heroin addict for 30 years? Would I, could I, would I take an opportunity to be forgiven for all the blood and violence that I had shed? Could I take an opportunity to be a loving person instead of uh, abusive and destroying young women's lives? Do I, would, I, would I take the chance if it were offered me? And I said, well, this is the hand that I was dealt. Can't nobody deal with me another hand. I got to play this hand out. He says, but I'm offering you, would you take it? I said, don't you know I deserve AIDS? I deserve hepatitis C. I deserve to be a drug addict. He said, you won't get what you deserve. You'll get what you negotiate. If I give you an opportunity, would you change? I told him I can't change. Nobody loves the pimp, the prostitute, the homosexual, the gang member. Nobody loves us. It's all a lie. And you can't help me and I can't help myself. Even if I wanted to change, I don't know how to change. I've been at this almost 30 years of my life. And I'm, I said, I'm a hope to die dope fiend. How in the world can you change me? And he said it once again. Isaiah. And the little boy that had been trapped in this, this, this wicked, ignorant body wanted to change and I cried out and I said if there is a light and you show it to me I'll follow you for the rest of my life and in what took me 30 years to be he cleaned me up in a nanosecond and everybody in that room got saved everybody everybody that night listen if God could rescue Isaiah based on a mother's prayer mm. What could God do in your family? Mm -hmm. You know, coming from Judaism, I understand that at the Passover, the premise is a lamb, not for an individual, a lamb for, for a them. mishpacha, for a family, yeah. a lamb for a house. Yeah. And those of you that are watching right now that don't know the Messiah, you just plain don't know. Would you? trade where you are right now for all those millions you were no, making. I'd die for this. Well, you heard that. <laughs> he would die for this. Choose this day who you shall serve. But as for me and my house, mm. we're serving the living God.